Hello. Uh, I think both sir and ma'am have joined us. Should we begin? I think so. Let me just confirm with our IT team. Uh, yes. Sam yes. sir and Vasu sir, shall we start? Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mekha, that's our green signal. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, everybody. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, uh, I am uh, Megha Yadav on the behalf of the Department of History, SRN University. I welcome all of you for uh, this webinar today. So, uh, just to introduce the webinar itself, uh, with this, with today's webinar, we begin with a webinar series for webinars. And we are very grateful that for our first webinar, Dr. Sebastian Joseph and Dr. Nandita Benelji have based us with our presence. And before I move on to introduce our speakers and the subsequent events, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Malvika Binni, the HOD of Department of History, to introduce or just to talk about the webinar series uh, in few details. Dr. Malvika Binni. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mekha. Uh, it is indeed a wonderful day and a pleasure and a privilege uh, uh, to invite our uh, speakers for the day. But at the same time, at the Department of History, SRMAP, we are all very delighted and thrilled to kick off our uh, departmental webinar series uh, with such a wonderful theme and such a wonderful speakers today uh, who I have sat uh, and listened to enthralled uh, who have introduced to uh, in, uh, India and South Indian history uh, several new streams and new strands of thinking. Uh, to just uh, let you know about the Department of History at SRM AP, uh, it's a very young department. Uh, we have been uh, functioning only for three years, but a very vibrant department. We have been very blessed with three batches of very brilliant and engaged students. Uh, they are the ones who uh, motivate us. In fact, this webinar also emerged uh, in uh, some of the discussions uh, with our students. And we've been very thankful that the university, uh, the dean of uh, SLAS and CS, as well as our VP, uh, they've been extremely supportive of uh, our our venture. So that's why we're thinking of this as a monthly uh, webinar where uh, each month we will be exploring a theme in history. And during the initial few months, uh, we are also thinking of introducing our students and, and also to uh, our uh, audience and listeners beyond SRM as well uh, to explore three themes like uh, Film, like environmental history, like global histories, like entangled history, to some in history. At the same time, we are also uh, thinking of uh, uh, inviting uh, uh, inviting scholars from sister disciplines like sociology, uh, anthropology, political science, political theory, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, let me also take this. Uh, to uh, welcome all our dear uh, students and also uh, students who have joined from uh, other institutions and of course our, uh, our esteemed colleagues uh, from this university and also uh, scholars who have joined from other universities. I can see Dr. K.S. Uh, I can also see Sanchita ma'am. Uh, I can see Rajasri ma'am. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, uh, so this month uh, we are having it today and the next uh, webinar in the webinar series uh, would be probably during the first uh, week of June. The announcement uh, will be out uh, very soon. Once again, uh, welcome to uh, SRM University's uh, Department of History's uh, Departmental uh, Webinar Series. And, and uh, again, we are truly excited to uh, start with this theme and to have Dr. Sebastian Joseph and Dr. Nandita Banerjee as our speakers today. Uh, thank you one and all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malvika, for that introduction. Uh, moving on to begin our today's webinar, uh, we have two very esteemed scholars, as Dr. Malvika has said, Dr. Sebastian Joseph and Dr. Nandita Banerjee. Uh, Dr. Seb Sebastian Joseph is not only a historian, but a very esteemed film critic as well, who has worked immensely in the field of uh, cinema and the intersection between 
in history. He has also been a recipient of the state award in 2020. And he has authored several works in the related field, one of uh, among which one is a very prominent, prominent book uh, named as uh, Come in India. Uh, I welcome you, uh, Dr. Sebastian Joseph. Our second speaker is Dr. Nandita Banerjee, who is again a pioneer in the field of film history and visual studies uh, in Indian film history and Indian cinema. Uh, she's an associate professor at Siddhu Pano, uh, Pano Bersa University. I welcome you, uh, Dr. Nandita Banerjee. Uh, thank you so much uh, to both of you for very graciously accepting our invitation and starting our webinar with this very interesting uh, theme. Uh, now, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Sebastian Joseph uh, to uh, begin our webinar. Uh, just one slight note that uh, after uh, the discussion, we can have a question answer session. So uh, uh, maybe we can do that both the speakers can present their papers and after that we can have the, or would you want to have it question answer answers after each speaker? However you would prefer, sir, ma'am. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable both ways, actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then uh, maybe once both the papers are there, after that we can have the question answers collectively. That would be better. Yeah. Yes. That's that's yeah. good. That's good. <coughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joseph. Uh, Dr. Malavika Bini, head of the department of history and liberal arts at Saram University. Dr. Mekha Yadu, friends and fellow men. So I think I am audible. Um, usually the first yes, sir. Yeah, OK. So in case of any range problem, I will put off my video and then go straight to uh, my presentation. So. Uh, first of all, I would like to start this uh, lecture um, with a question of uh, importance to all, all of you, a question which is very important to all of you. So what is actually history? History can be defined in two ways. One is that it's the history it's a representation of the past or as past itself. When some people say history, it is the past. When some people say history in the academic circles, it is a representation of the past. So this has to be taken very seriously when you understand what is film history. Film history, as I intend to um, focus on today, is film history is a representation of history. As well as film history is a representation of the present for the future historians or the future history lovers. Uh, when we talk about film history, so there is an agreement between myself and uh, uh, Nandida Banerjee. Uh, because you know, I will be concentrating on the film history method, and Nandita Banerjee will be concentrating on an explanation of this method through illustrating or you know, screening some of the films. Maybe films which I do not mention, but ask according to her uh, liking. So, film history can be divided into three types. Uh, the rubric of film history, you can uh, classify film history as three, under three categories. The first one is the history of the film industry. It deals with, or it focuses on the development of the film industry. For example, it studies the development of film technology, screening technologies, cinematography, sound systems. It can also deal with the making of stardom in cinema, the superstardom or the universal or mega stardom as 
the fans call them. Of course, it also deals with the social aspects of cinema making. It can even be the life world of a light boy in the film industry. So this is the first genre of uh, film history, uh, which portrays into the technicalities as well as the social side of uh, making of the films as an, in the industry. So it's not the history of the industry proper, but the history of the components or uh, important elements that constitute the industry. And the second type of film history, which historians have classified is the film as such is a, a source for history. Any film that is produced in any time, that's why he said the present to be screened for the past, for the future in that sense. So the present is very important in the sense that, you know, the present is sometimes, you know, it is, it's very important for the historian to understand, you know. Sometimes, you know, the, some of the films which are not historical as we think are historical in future, in the coming days. For example, if you take, for example, the film, as all of you know, in these very pandemic times, pandemic stricken times, COVID times, the 2011 released the film Contagion, you know, that becomes a historical film today in 2021, just after a matter of, you know, 10 years, it's film history. There are other uh, films also, you know, a lot of films, Outbreak, Flu, there is a Malayalam film called Virus. All, you know, forecasting into a type of, you know, a medical, medical thriller, um, a pandemic thriller in that sense, something, sometimes it takes the course of a detective uh, and a feeling, how the virus is <clears throat> found out. So any feeling depicting the present, the present issues, the problems, the systems, the geography, gender relations, the technology, for example, the transportation modes, the changing faces of cities, villages, a terrible people, anything can be taken as a source for uh, history. This is, this comes under the rubric of uh, uh, films as a source for history, any film. And the third type which comes under the rubric that is types of film history is historical film. Historical film is the most problematic at the same time uh, controversial uh, it can lead into controversies because of the lack of objectivity or fictionalization, things like that. So historical film is the adaptation of, a, of an event. Sometimes it can be the history of a person, the biopic. Sometimes it can be a costume drama. Sometimes it's a period film. Sometimes films can go beyond these type of, you know, usual conventional film histories and it can problematize um, an event, a concept. For example, films can do very well with the concept of the ideology of colonialism through different stories. So these are the three different types of film histories. We'll be covering all these in this, but in this particular lecture, I'll be concentrating on the examination of films or analysis of films um, within um, a particular problem of, you know, imagination and objectivity. Whenever we think about films, you know, usually the historian of any kind, you know, usually the first doubt that comes arises in one's mind is that, you know, it's totally imaginative. So imagination, you know, definitely will kill us objectivity. So films are not objective. Uh, they are actually a fictitious representation of uh, the past. Uh, so what is old out here is imagination. Imagination is ruled out here uh, because imagination is not acceptable to the historian. As if historian writes, you know, history without imagination because historian uses all types of, you know, criticism, all types of uh, methods in order to excavate into the, um, into the making of the sources and then the sources are analyzed and then facts are derived and then we present the history very objective kind of history, as if one is able to present the exact past as Leopold von Reinsett. 
So here the question of imagination is the most important thing, the problem that I wish to explain for the participants in this uh, webinar. So I myself have created a, something like an equation. When you look at a textual history or a textualized history, that is the normal history in that sense, you know, cinema can be considered something like a new normal in that sense for historians. So when you take it as a normal history or textual history, you take this equation, historical evidence or evidences, primary, secondary, tertiary, plus analysis, plus imagination is textual history. Because in analysis and in writing, the imagination is uh, an essential thing that happens even without your understanding. The historian is imagining. He is engaged in the process of imagination. He's recreating, not creating. Sometimes he is uh, deconstructing the real and making it unreal. Then there is imagination. Imagination, uh, for your understanding, imagination is not falsification, but imagination is the mental process that is happening in a higher cognitive uh, level of you know, explanation, description, and analysis. Finally, creating a narrative uh, which is uh, solid, which is credible, and uh, which is um, in harmony, in tandem with the evidences that the historian um, collected from the archives or the evidences which are there in the uh, archives or any other form of evidence, including the artifacts or oral testimonies, what kind of uh, you know, sources the historian is undertaking. So evidence plus analysis plus imagination is, is equal to textual history. But while you go to the other equation, it is a, it's actually it's a cinematic history Textual history versus cinematic history is the agenda here. Story plus history plus imagination. In cinema, um, the crucial factor, the crucial element of a cinema is the storyline. No doubt about that, which is translated into a cinematic sort of visualization for the entertainment or not for the entertainment. So in popular films, it is for the entertainment and in uh, serious films, it can be for study, it can be for analysis, but the basic purpose of cinema is entertainment. If entertainment is the basic purpose of cinema, the primary agenda of the filmmaker, what we do is secondary only, you know, because basically the cinema looks at the spectators, you know, including you, me, and all types of people. So story plus history plus imagination is equal to cinematic history. There also you can see the role play of imagination. So without imagination, uh, without a kind of, you know, thinking that is happening exterior to the facts or sources that you have collected happens this process, this mental process of imagination. The whole construction of the narrative is brought under this particular rubric of the mental apparatus and to the intellectual engagements of the historian with the facts and uh, evidences of the uh, uh, problem that he is investigating. Actually, this is an investigation in that sense. The filmmaker is a role. The filmmaker of a historical film also engages in an investigation in that sense. Every scene is to be depicted as an investigation, leading to the final meaning creation or a meaning attribution of a, a film, be it a historical film or any other film. So the word imagine refers to, actually it refers to the capacity of the human mind Dr. Malaviga. Uh, Dr. Malaviga, uh, yes, sir. Uh, see, uh, you can stop me at uh, your uh, you know, fixed scheduled time. Hmm? No problem. Uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Please do it. Okay. So the word imagine refers to, it actually refers to the capacity of the human mind to create mental images of phenomena which are not available to perception. It's actually a psychological work of invention inherent in fantasy. To imagine implies, it implies an internal process of critiquing, analysis and all. The imagine implies an internal process. At the same time, the imagine also is exterior to the observation of the real because imagination is usually seen as illusionary character. 
it is understandable that historians hello i see oh, okay i was asking can you see me on the screen yeah there is a ray. yeah there is uh, there is a problem of range that's so, you yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madhavi. So history, in that sense, you know, uh, philosophers of history, you have they have spoken about this historical imagination. In that sense, historical imagination is different from other kinds of imagination because there are certain fixed boundaries for the historian to imagine. Likewise, these boundaries also make impose a certain restrictions on the filmmaker also for imagination. So the imagination of a historical filmmaker is different from the imagination of a filmmaker of the ordinary cinema or normal film, which is not historical, which uh, you know does not belong to the category or genre of historical film. Paul Lacombe in 1894 already made uh, this type of a categorical assertion stating that to quote him, I must say here a few words about a type of experience which is only possible in history that is imaginary experience. So what is possible in history is an imaginary experience. You have to experience, you're also experiencing that. Further this idea, you can see there is an elaboration of this idea in Collingwood's uh, work where he concentrates on historical imagination where the whole elaboration of a historical narrative itself is depending on this particular capacity of imagination. For some of, even some of the conventional historians like Collingwood, the structure of the narrative is the same for fiction and history. The structure of the narrative is same for history and also for fiction. Both operate according to the principle of an a priori imagination. So imagination is there, but the principle of working of the imagination happens without the historian understanding that he himself is imagining. So the difference between history and fiction lies in the relative freedom or constraint the writer enjoys. Uh, you know, there is a freedom for uh, the fictional imagination in the case of a writer of a novel or a short story because the fictional imagination is restrained only by the dictates of uh, vermicillitude. The writer is free to invent characters and events, but he needs to show that the behavior of characters and the sequence of events develop according to an internal logic that the reader accepts as credible. So there also imagination becomes very, very, very responsible in that sense, a responsible kind of imagination. In other words, characters and events are well motivated and fit into a system of causality. That is the essence of a well-crafted narrative. The historian here works, therefore, as we understand, um, all historian works on evidences which are simply representations and not real objects. So a historian is working on an established representation or a written representation or an artifactual representation or a representation through memory. It emphasizes the importance of construction of the images in the mind of the historian. And these images are external to the historian them himself. And so the historian has to, the historian or the researcher has to bring in these uh, images into the narrative and logically connect the narrative with history. So this happens in history and also in cinema, historical cinema. In fact, in history, we operate not on real objects, but on representations we make as, uh, we make out of these objects. Actually, we don't see the men, we don't see the people, we don't see the ecologies, the landscape, the animals, the houses, you know. We do not see these institutions we describe. Without seeing these institutions, we are forced to imagine the men, the objects, the acts, the motives we are studying. 
It is the images that are practical material of the social sciences, especially history. It is the images that we analyze, the images as represented in earlier forms of representation. So imagination, the kind of imagination that I am talking about today is not the imagination of the novelist or the short story writer, but the historical imagination, which is responsible imagination of the historian, defined or restricted by the boundaries. At the same time, the Im imagination in cinema sometimes overlaps. I will also explain that you know, where the imagination overlaps, imagination exceeds into uh, a very different domain in order to uh, convince the spectator, because spectator is the most important uh, person as far as the film industry is concerned. Here, I would like to take the first problem is, you know, actually understanding what is imagination, what is historical imagination, and how historical imagination is, sometimes looks like fictional, um, fictionalization of the data or creation of images, moving images in order to depict a kind of problem easily understandable to the audience. At the same time, it is very important as Malaviga has, you know, noted the title, in the title, a term which is usually very uh, foreign or, you know, which is a very novel term, even though it was, you know, introduced uh, some uh, 20, 30 years before, history of 40. As a term that is invented by the postmodern historian Hayden White, he calls on historians, actually he demanded the historians to revise the approach to visual material. What is your approach to the visual material? Because engrossed in a discipline of words, history has failed to recognize the specificity of the visual media. Because historians, they have already, you know, a, a lacking in historiography to recognize the specific importance of the visual media. At the same time, images and these kind of visual representations are subordinated or reduced to the status of illustration or a, a simple appendix or a complement to written discourses. So, but the visual evidence itself, you know, is a type of history. That's the interpretation of um, Hayden Light. A photograph itself is a history. A film itself is a history. So what he suggests is that visual representations of history have their own genius. Uh, particularly in the realms of landscape, scenes, atmosphere, complex events such as wars, battles, crowd happenings, and emotions. It is very difficult to textually format emotional history, but you can easily uh, film an emotional history. You can, uh, you can uh, definitely uh, film histories of emotion, fear, agony, love, hatred, violence, etc. So such representations are not only really more vermicular, he argues, but also more accurate. So Hayden White takes you know, a very radical position in this matter. Talking that, see what we understand from Hayden White's uh, analysis is the fact that historiography and history 40, that's what, why I understand, why, what I understand from Hayden White's theories. Historiography and history 40, are two types of historiographies. So historiography, you take it for the textual historiography. History of 40 is another kind of historiography itself. So there is actually, there is no difference between historiography and history of 40. Both implies a kind of representation of history. A very radical, a postmodern, an emancipatory kind of historical, historiographical ideology. So other historians have also followed this. Now, as of now, there are many historians in India, but more in Western countries who work on the history of films. For example, you have the works of Robert Rosenstein, who uh, took the cue from Hayden White, and Hayden White also complimented Rosenstein in that sense as a postmodern historian of films. Hey, uh, Rosenstein is there, Nadali Simon Davis is there, Pierre Zorman is there. So there are so many historians, uh, Marcia Landy, all of them work on, uh, you know, uh, film history. Uh, they have, uh, there are many theories associated with historical film. 
Now I am concentrating on some points which are raised by, to my mind, the most prominent and popular historian of cinema film, Robert Rosenstein. He talks about cinema from the point of view as a story. History is told in cinema as a story, a story which has got a beginning and middle and an end. Uh, usually histories are not like that. Histories, you know, sometimes you take conceptually, you categorize uh, problems in history and you divide into chapters, but <clears throat> the reader, because you believe that the reader wants this kind of a history, segmentized history, problematic history, conceptually, you know, defined history with specific boundaries for historical explanation. But in cinema, history is to be seen as a story. Very, very simple thing. But this story should have a beginning and middle and an end. Otherwise, the cinema cannot get hold of one or attract the audience who are sitting in front of the screen. The spectator is the most important phenomena in cinema, be it historical film or any other film. And the second aspect is that in cinema, if history is translated as story, then the history is basically told as stories of individuals, either men or women. And the solution to their personal problems substitutes solution to historical problems. This is the charm of story telling, uh, history telling through stories, solution of personal problems as a substitute uh, for the solution of historical problems. So the personal becomes a method here of neg neglecting the difficult social problems addressed by the films. This is for making the history more easy for the people who are sitting as audience on the screen. History must be simple in that sense. On the time, communication of meaning is very important. Because whatever happens on the screen, the meaning of the particular event is to be translated, communicated uh, immediately to the audience. It is not like reading a book. That is the uh, secret of, that's the politics of history being told as stories of individuals and stories of groups. And the third characteristic feature that historical film engages with is, as Rosenstein argues is, close the simple and completed past. As we understand, the textual histories, you know, you can see, you know, a completed past in textual histories, you know, one interpretation is coming, then so many other interpretations will come. You naturally expect more interpretations, you know. But in historical films, it provides no alternative possibilities for a continuation of the problem that is discussed there once the film exhibition is over. It admits no doubts. There is an assertion of the historical past. It admits no doubts because the filmmaker do not want the spectator to go with doubts. And if the spectator is doubtful about some of the happenings inside the cinema, then definitely uh, that the problem is that the cinema will be running into such controversies, you know. And the fourth thing is that the cinema personalize, dramatize and emotionalize. Emotionalization of uh, history is a bad thing for many historians, you know. When you say that emotionalization of history is negative because it nullifies the credibility of the history, you know. Film history, you know, historical films usually personalize, dramatize, and emotionalize. In what way? Because films, uh, you know, as victory, as joy, as agony, defeat, subjugation, love, heroism, etc. These are the basic emotional attributes the cinema engages with, popular historical film engages with. And also it uses the camera angles, the music, the sound to intensify such feelings, you know. The spectator is not like a reader. The reader has to make this type of emotions, you know, as his own because there is nobody to um, uh, use a particular mechanism to uh, make you more emotive in that sense while you read a book. But in cinema, the cinema effectively uses the camera, the technologies like music and sound to intensify such feelings to easily influence the audience. These are some of the characteristic traits of historical films. And the fifth uh, feature of historical film is that the strength of the material milieu, 
the material medium is very important in historical film because the any type of film, be it a biopic or a period film or a problematic film belonging to a higher level of cognitive type of historical film, it needs to exhibit landscapes, it needs to exhibit buildings, it needs to exhibit weapons. It shows also common objects uh, appeared in the past as and when they were in use. Sometimes the cinema needs to recreate the entire life with, of the people. So the material milieu is reconstructed in history. The reconstruction of the material milieu is problematic as well as prospective for the film because two types of imagination happens here. One imagination is the imagination of the director or the filmmaker or the production team as well as the imagination of uh, the audience to make more the, the audience more imaginative in that sense. And the sixth point is that a film history shows history as a process. Indeed, it represents the economic issues, racial issues, class conflicts, caste issues, and gender lives of the people. Where the written history compartmentalizes these, the film integrates these elements. The film cannot compartmentalize that and deal with one component in one scene. It's not like it is spread over the scenes. That is again, again a limitation as well as um, an advantage of the films. Because it is to be seen as a process, a continuation is to be there. Every factor is, every aspect is integrated. So film integrates where written history compartmentalized. At the same time, it also sometimes, you know, invents, you know, certain things, you know, because as Rosen, Rosenstein and Nadali Simon Davies and almost all the historians argue, the most important thing is that on the screen, history must be fictional for it to be true because the word and the image work differently. The legitimate use of the fiction on the screen is very important because history is to be fictional for it to be true because the word and the image work very differently. These are two types of historical representation. That's a film condenses an event. <clears throat> It summarizes the data and simplifies complexities. It engages with ideas, it engages with issues and arguments through every short. Every short is an explanation, is an extension of the idea that is motored by the filmmaker in a historical film. And Rosenstein suggests, Rosenstein here suggests, with this, I will wind up my talk. Robert Rosenstein suggests several fictional moves as techniques of historical representation. One is compression, the second is condensation, the third is alteration, and finally you have the metaphor. Compression, it's actually a dramatic technique of representing a relatively large historical event through relatively short scenes that compact or epitomize the entire problem, even a problem of representing a social group, uh, through specific fictional characters. And Rigney calls this type of uh, fictionalization compression as the making of the figures in the crowd. The entire crowd cannot be taken as, you know, as heroes, only one hero. So compression is actually a very dramatic uh, type of representation. And the second thing that Rosenstein uses is, you know, it's again a similar figure that applies both to written history and film history, the selection of specific facts from all the archival sources to represent the collective experience of large social groups. This is called condensation. The cinema cannot make use of all the sources and evidences and uh, integrate this into a cinematic experience. So it takes certain specific facts in order to elaborate the story, which is called condensation. So both compression and condensation can be characterized as a figurative operation in the order of fictionalizing cinema. Whereas the third factor is alteration, which operates historically. It refers to changes the filmmaker and historian makes in uh, documenting a historical film. Certain changes are you know, made. Which, which will be explained as 
uh, true invention and false inventions by Rosenstein. And finally, the metaphor, it is actually the technique of simplifications, you know, which is uh, made in um, using certain specific images or series of images uh, to stand for more abstract statements. So condensation, compression, alteration, and metaphor are some of the key elements, which finally goes to the invention category, the invention of uh, uh, certain characters or certain instances or certain ideas, which postmodern historians term as true invention and false invention in historical films. So true invention and false invention, true invention are, is strictly in the order of the archive, in the order of the factual documents and false invention are the inventions which are made you know, out of uh, the understanding by using a particular kind of reasoning of the filmmaker. So an adaptation, you know, something like an addendum addition to the existing uh, interpretation and imagination, which need not be historical. But the fact that that, that particular imagination is not historical imagination does not make the seriousness of the film history because like uh, uh, Natalie Simon Davies argues, uh, Natalie Simon Davies is another major uh, uh, film historian. Uh, she argues that in historical film, in which primary plot is based on actual historical events, on which an imagine, imagine the plot unfolds in such a way, and imagine the plot unfolds in such a way that actual historical events are central and intrinsic to the story. The actual historical events are central and intrinsic to the story, but there are certain imagina imaginations which exceeds, <clears throat> which transcends from such a kind of responsible and critical imagination uh, that is an argument made by Natalie Simon Davies. So there is nothing to worry about was, was as, a source, source, as a source of history, as a source for his historical interpretation and historical analysis, because the usual contestation from the conventional historians that films are inaccurate, distort the past, fictionalized, trivialize and romanticize people and events can be considered only as uh, the limitation of the methodologies used by some historians, the limitation of the methodologies used by the historians because the films are not under the control of historians. The films are not under the control of the historian. They actually portray a world which the books cannot present through mere words. So what I argue uh, in some and substance is the idea that films are to be taken very seriously by historians, research scholars, and other interested people because films accommodate differences, it accommodates different kinds of emotions, it integrates differences, into very interesting stories, which are histories. As you all know, Harari remarked, human civilization, the entire of human civilization is made of such stories. Because we, the people, the humans, have the capacity to think and imagine. And out of our thoughts and imagination have come out the events and the processes and the ideologies, whatever you call as histories. So behind every history, there's a story. So there is no way in looking at the films as a secondary source for history, but films can be considered as a primary source for history and historical explanation. Thank you. I stop here. Thank you so much, sir, for so comprehensively explaining the concepts of film history and the paradigms of both cinematic world and the historical world and the relationship uh, between both of them. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very enriching experience to uh, listen to this. Uh, now taking this very interesting flow of thought forward, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Namita Banerjee for uh, her lecture. Uh, Ma'am, 
just one tiny uh, note for the audience. Uh, if there are questions, please drop them in the chat box. And at the end of the lecture, uh, we can take those questions uh, with both the professors. Uh, Dr. Banerjee. Very good morning to all of you. After uh, such a wonderful lecture delivered by uh, <clears throat> Professor Sebastian Joseph, um, I'm really, really happy uh, that today we could uh, get engaged in such a, an interesting session. And um, uh, we are actually uh, also like uh, just now Mohammed wrote that we are also looking forward to have a discussion with the theme that he had presented. So <clears throat> today, what I am also planning, I do have two, three visuals that I plan to show. Uh, I don't know how much um, that will be relevant to the, uh, because uh, I think uh, it's, um, today I, I thought of speaking on the visual impact and uh, the visual impact and the <clears throat> role of uh, certain things that I will, I will just uh, eventually come to my points while I will be uh, discussing on that. But I have two, three um, clips that I will uh, get into it. Uh, first, I will begin it like that, that uh, what exactly is historiography, a historian's dilemma. So I will start with uh, E.H. Carr's What is History? That learning from history is never simply a one-way process to learn about the present in the light of the past means also to learn about the past in the light of the present. So the function of history is to promote a profounder understanding of both past and present through the interrelation between them. And many years ago, <clears throat> the historian J.H. Plum, he admitted, he had admitted that the most difficult task of a historian was to explain how ideas become, at, become attitudes. So the story of images and their ability to influence mentality is relevant in this context. Images and stories are old and established ways of remembering the past. So in some ways, visual history is older than oral history. Since the dawn of human history, Visual art has influenced the formation and evolution of social memory. During the Paleolithic period, hunting gathering communities resorted to cave paintings to recreate and express their feelings, <clears throat> activities, desires, and indeed life itself. These cave paintings are found in many parts of the world and only experts can tell us whether men and women of the Stone Age become part-time artists in an endeavor to leave behind records consciously. Undoubtedly, these incredible expressions, scenes depicting group activities like hunting, sacrifices, funerals, etc., enrich our understanding of these societies along with other things like tools, bones, fossils, and occasionally preserved human remains. <clears throat> From the Neolithic and Calculatic ages, etching, sketching, painting, and modeling developed as diverse and cultivated ways of generating, preserving, and leaving behind historical records by largely pre-literate pre -literate societies. So in Calculatic Egypt, Harappa, Mesopotamia, and China are justifiably renowned for their visual art. And archeologists take these records very seriously with other uh, <coughs> evidence at their disposal. Since the ancient period, visual art grew to embody a significant component of public history alongside oral and other traditions. So in countries like India, sculpture, painting, pottery and temple and rock carvings, such as the ones found in Ajanta, Ilora, Sanchi, Puri, Konarak, so many places where very important media of depicting socio-cultural expressions. 
Now, this situation remained unchanged even in those societies, which later made the transition to path literacy, portraits, landscapes, documentary illustration, and still life became increasingly popular in almost all societies on the threshold of modernization. So the past came to be increasingly associated with images drawn by artists. In Europe, the past as an accurate image through the artist's eyes and with the help of his tools gained significant currency from the Renaissance onwards. So technology added, aided this process and better paints and ink improved paints and watercolors made for more lasting objects, portraying reality to begin with. And finally, these products became <clears throat> as if the past quote unquote, as it must have been to gaze at and theorize. So without seeing too much in this early development, it is very tempting to anticipate the emergence of a later day positivism and realism in them. So the belief in the capability of the human eye to observe and human hands to reproduce. Truth was fortified by the evolution of the specialized visual arts. Now, I, <clears throat> uh, there is another question. Uh, there is a very pertinent question that always uh, haunt us that can historians view photos and the cinema on par with other evidence as legitimate sources or sources of history? Can history be written without documentary sources or with only partial reference to some documentary evidence? Or can there be a history which does not privilege literacy over other forms of knowledge? So our attitude towards historiography will depend upon the answers to these questions. So if a historian choose to stick to documentary sources, they end up limiting the scope of their enterprise. They will then consciously turn their back on those people who may not figure in documentary sources, but might appear as crucial traces in visual sources of both past and present. They might even miss out crucial facts recorded by cameras like the ones carried by, uh, say, German soldiers deep into Poland and Russia during the Second World War and ironically end up writing a history deficient in facts. The Holocaust and widespread German atrocities in East Europe acquired both a greater facticity and human sensitivity precisely because of the visual recordings of these horrors often made by the Germans themselves. Can historians even for a moment conceive of writing a history of the Vietnam War or the contemporary US excesses in Iraq without reference to photographic or oral evidence? Would the evidence from Iraq have emerged with half its poignancy and so instantiously without the digital camera and its connectivity with the internet? So, you know, there are a lot of, uh, imagine the difference between American and British soldiers, smoking, laughing and clapping while pointing at the genitals of a broken beaten and humiliated Iraqi prisoner as photographic evidence of history and as documentary narrative emerging many months or years after the Iraq tragedy. Closer home, video recordings of greedy politicians and retired army officers eagerly accepting bribes add up to interesting visual sources indispensable for contemporary history. Even like the Babri Masjid demolition of 1992 and subsequent developments leading up to the Gujarat carnage of 2002 have an established film history by now. A documentary history of these events cannot be written without reference to this camera footage. Such footage is necessary to refresh social memory and public history. It has been used by some filmmakers to make excellent documentaries. Rakesh Sharma made a film on the Gujarat program of 2002, 
masterminded by the Sang Parivar not long after the event. Though this film has received international recognition, the Indian censor board has predictably remained lukewarm to it. Some, uh, there are so many, I, I won't get into it. So, uh, so much for, so for treating the cinema as a historical source. And what about film as another mode of history? Precisely today, this was our, my topic of discussion, uh, that what ex can <clears throat> cinema be really called a source, a proper source of uh, writing history? So let us first see the reasons why the popularity of historical films beats the book. Once you accept Rosenstone's premise that uh, film is a disturbing symbol of an increasingly post-literate world in which people can read but won't, the road to a systematic quote-unquote understanding of Hayden White's Historia Forty starts. White's concept refers to the representation of history and our thought about it in visual images and filmic discourse. Can we even think of history and especially modern history without reference to visual representation? Is there a modern home without a chronologically arranged photo album? What would be the history of modern warfare, for instance, without the photos of atrocities committed by invaders in Poland, Russia, China, Vietnam, the more Africa, and more recently, in many places. Uh, you know, films claim to present an alternative to written history rests on the answers to these questions. And undoubtedly, there are zones from which photos and films as eloquent factual testimonies emerge, but documents do not for obvious reasons. Now, Rosen, we, again, I come back to Rosenstein. Rosenstein asserts that historical films, both drama and documentary, derive their popularity from criteria they share with narrative history. They present history as a story of progress, which is individually driven and finally inevitable. Only experimental films question this format by criticizing the narratives of modernity, progress, individual heroism, and history as inevitable drama. Hence, the experimental film opens up possibilities of new histories emerging on the screen. However, the strength of the historical film lies in emotionalizing personalizing and dramatizing the past. The period look at presence offers the viewers an ostensible window into the past. So, but by, by far the greatest asset of the historical film is its uh, ability to show history as an integrated process to a very curious audience. It is this ability of the film which poses the greatest challenge to written history. Historians also try to paint a holistic picture of the past, but very few of them are writers of prose good enough to successfully do so, unfortunately. In contrast, the capability of a good film to bring alive, figuratively speaking, various dimensions and details of a social setting simultaneously is very, very impressive. There is no dearth of examples to illustrate this point. Music enhances this effect. In combination with flesh and blood actors enacting historical or fictional characters, dress, weapons, facial expressions, voice, emotional, uh, emotional expressions, the camera produces a very powerful historical effect on the audience. So salt and paper historians may continue to trash historical films as essentially fiction, but none of us can ignore that such films has become a preferred mode of receiving and understanding the past in contemporary society. So finally, how would we locate the historical film? How does the historian situate the historical film? Towards the experimental film, which portrays social reality in a departure from narrative history, we can easily adopt a very favorable attitude. For instance, 
films highlighting systematic exploitation, the underworld, wage slavery, the emotional trauma of women or problems of migrant workers and the unemployed need not fictionalize history. For that is the stuff history is made of in any case. They are necessary to draw our attention to many emotions which written history either ignores or cannot express. They do constitute the most productive film histories and should be accepted as such. Historians will face no problems in contextualizing them. Hence, to illustrate the point further, a new wave quote unquote film without being a quote unquote period film often becomes an excellent example of a historical film. Recreation of human feelings in realistic social situations, like the ones involving the exercise of power and exploitation, is more important to these films than a period look. However, this does not mean that the directors of these films don't pay adequate attention to historical details. A film like Shambhanegal's Ankur, for example, is at once historical in its focus on rural feudalism in a region of South India and socio-cultural in presentation. The same is true of Govind Nihalini's Akrosh, which underscores the exploitation of tribals by India's ruling elite and their agents. But what about the historical film which fictionalizes history? To begin with, it must be understood and conceded from the viewpoint of accuracy that all historical films are fictional to a lesser or greater extent. If any were not, that would bore the audience to death and faint at the box office. So without the play of imagination, fictional characters, invented minor events, and emotional responses of historical persons, the historical films even cannot be made. So in contrast, suppose the historian begins analyzing films by first asking himself a question regarding the authenticity of his product. Do historians manage to paint a true picture or even a literal picture of the past with the aid of their conceptual tools and documentary sources? What would their discipline be without the aid of imagination, turn of phrase, selection, and editing of sources? Once the process of writing history itself is critically evaluated, its monopoly over historical truth weakens. Historians should never have exercised this monopoly given the fact that the ancillary disciplines of history, the chief sources of his facts like anthropology, archaeology, geology, geography, economics, etc., have themselves been in a state of constant evolution. So according to Rosenstern, historians express themselves in words. These are powerful enough to express complicated feelings in a very condensed form. But is the universe of words enough or relevant enough to express the truth about the past? We must admit that though words are not enough to express the total richness of human or other experience, historians and social scientists seem to have very little choice in that matter. Perhaps this is where the power of the film makes a difference. So people take history written by trained historians seriously because they think historians know the past better than anyone else. While this may well be true, historians should resist the temptation of converting their rights over the past into a monopoly. So these are people who continue to believe that historians narrate the truth about the past or at least that they on their side do so. So the cinema became popular. After history had already consolidated its hold over a literate public as an academic subject, the age of post-literacy in which people could but did not read emerged much later, men and women who went to schools and universities had a fair idea of history against which to examine films. Hence, 
films could not operate in a social vacuum they had to be made and screened in reaction in sorry in relation to growing historical knowledge as also the knowledge being forged by the simultaneous development of the other social sciences therefore the historical film could cannot and should not be allowed to affect white like some history books a historical innocence in its making while urging historians to consider visual history very gently uh, we can hardly transfer the arrogance of historians to the filmmakers so they should not be allowed to get away with the assumption that historical films can be made with disdain for very carefully crafted written history important events for instance can be fictionalized but not falsified because the answer to facticity is not a very happy relapse into relativism victories cannot be shown as defeats and defeats as victories so participation cannot be invented where there is none atrocities should be reported fearlessly and the difference between imagination and a certain degree of realism must be adhered to while making historical films as mentioned as i said earlier that films are eminently equipped to portray many emotions and experiences uh, which actually have no written histories they have the power to illustrate concepts and hence complement and enrich written texts with this power to borrow a sentence say from even from spiderman spiderman the famous film the famous show television show um, that comes with great responsibility you know so love humiliation hatred anger helplessness emotional repression and even protest are only inadequately addressed by most of the written history but these feelings visual history could do very well to remember existing historical contexts uh, conceptually explained by written history and these contexts are not always very easy to reproduce in pseudo historical uh, proud settings sorry period settings so it must never be forgotten that historians explanation help the cinema in the same way as historical fiction stokes historians imagination hence in dealing with the cinema and especially its potential to highlight emotions and its hitherto to trouble relationship with academic history there is an advice to achieve a healthy intellectual balance of the unhistorical and historical which must be heeded uh now i have two three clips that i uh, had i'm planning to show is to you um, largely the first one is actually of the famous um, pathir panchali by the famous railway scene by oppu and durga uh, can can we play it? can we play it malvika uh, yes ma'am yes ma'am yes. give yes. give me a minute ha huh. just two minutes of uh, each clip sir uh, okay this is uh, from patel panchali uh, i hope everyone can see the visual uh, it is Ms. visual okay thank you famous scene actually it's it's a it's of uh, 3 minutes and 34 seconds i don't think we have that much of time because i just i was just planning to show you two three more clips
Godhead Panchali is a novel by Bhuti Bhushan Mandapadhyay that was made a very successful film, but not very commercially successful earlier. But it became the milestone. I just uh, Anna. wanted to show the expression when they can first get a glimpse of the train. very famous sequence uh, uh, relating to Opu's sighting of the train. Uh, I hope I'm audible here. Yeah. And uh, it is in fact inaugurated by a very multiple sense of time with a view of, uh, you know, Sharboja inanimate in word. And uh, earlier it was uh, uh, conflicted in her relationship with the grand aunt in the whatever. So, uh, the train sequence, it provides for a very seamless sense for the emergence of time within the landscape of Shantiniketan painterly modes and a spatial strategy presenting new figure ground relations to induct the movement of the train and of history into the frame. So in contrast, uh, we can suggest that there is an emphatic disjoinment exercise at the level of the representation, drawing the viewer into a very new economy of perception, one that walks through the thematics of history, not as a seamless emergence, but as a rupturing and a positing of a new and distancing perspective. Interestingly, it is through the realm of the instincts and senses one contrasted to the realm of verbalized language because there is very little dialogues in it only Oppo is asking Durga that what is it because uh, this is the first time they get a chance to see all these things and now they're uh, a little far away from home and everything is new to them everything is very new so you know I think there is the time and there is the uh, exact uh, timing when draw Ray Satyajit Ray draws us into this new field of perception. And for it is through Durga that the spectator is routed into a new sense perception as moving ahead of Popo. She registers strange vibrations. I, I don't think we could sh show you this because she was just putting her ear into it. Huh. You're into the pillar and she could feel the vibration before a train comes. And as, as you know, capturing the tremor of modernity, as it is relayed in the tactile form of a very quivering telegraph code. And uh, later we will find that Oku is playing telegraph, telegraph, and uh, he is creating his own telegraph code. So as if needing to walk disruptive effects of the sensation into filmic structures, Satyajit Ray resorts to a very rare discontinuity, a temporal gap intruding in the abrupt cut that shows Opu entering the space around the telegraph pole after Durga has left it. And the compulsion to repeat, to go through it again and again, highlights the moment and the space as symbolically charged, as marked off from the seamless flow of previous time. 
So I think I have two, three more visuals. Uh, I think, and, and let me just tell you, because I, I just thought of playing these visuals because there is a very interesting um, uh, form of showing flashbacks, how we are going into the flashbacks and how through the source of flashbacks, we are again coming into, coming back into the history, that history inside the films through flashbacks. So Malvika, can we show the two, three visuals? Only two minutes. Yeah, the next one. Sure, ma'am. It's, a, it's from uh, Tapan Sinha's uh, Harmonium. I don't know whether... It's, this uh, is the different... Yeah. Right? Just, just a song. Let's do it. Yes, ma'am. Shall I continue yeah. playing the song? Or? No, no, no. I think I think it's enough. It's enough. Okay. <laughs> actually, it's a story of an a harmonium, an organ, and that actually brings ill luck. To some people, it brings ill luck, and you know how it gets um, transferred from one place to another, and how it exchanges hands, and uh, finally it comes back to its owner. So that lady with whom Arunthati played by Arunthati Devi, uh, she was playing that uh, song, Mon Bole Ami Moner Kotha Jane. It's a beautiful song, very, very beautiful. Yeah, the male version was sung by Hemantu Mukhopadhyay. So actually, she is getting that flashback that she happened to be the daughter of a Zamindar played by Ashit Boron. And while <clears throat> the camera takes you back to that, uh, you know, that Bajra uh, and uh, the, the river where that song was being played when she was a very little girl of, say, eight, nine year old. And then uh, there were two, one couple. Uh, yeah. So one Odhikari and um, his wife, who used to do kind of jhumur dances in the in the yatras, in the local plays and all. And finally, also, there is a link to it because they had a daughter who is now there in the brothel played by Arati Mukhopadhyay. Yeah, sorry, Arati Bhattacharya. And again, the harmonium will reach her also in no time. So how uh, an organ and how the story is stitched and how there is this crisscross relationship between everyone, everybody had a very, um, a very interesting link. And with this flashback and flash forward, how you are getting, being reminded of that event. So I thought that this is a very important film, very interest, very, very interesting, film. a commercial one, but a very good film. And uh, two more films, uh, one is from Prahar. Uh, there is also an, um, I, I want to show it to you because I think there is a, a very sense of, um, I won't call it depression, but there is a very, uh, you know, uh, sense of losing someone losing and then at the same time rediscovering yourself so i just thought of showing it to you for one or two maybe one minutes uh, of this praha and then uh, that umrao janwala that's it these are the last two clips <laughs> Yeah. 
prostitute and by chance he gets a chance to visit that place now malvika can we just play the last part of it the last part of that earlier clip yeah because he gets reminded yeah when there is a there is a lady who thinks that he's a prospective customer so she invites him inside and this is the same place this is the same uh, residence where he was brought up actually so and how the memories there actually they starts yeah exactly they starts haunting him like anything yes that's it that's it so this is a beautiful beautiful song actually um, there is a rashid khan wala also yeah so then the last one the last that um, just that's also a very famous song we will just uh, अच्छा अमीरत अगर उस दिन वो लोग तुम्हें मेरी जगह ले जाते तो तो तुम्हें मिलता वो कोठा और मुझे ये कोठी <laughs> अच्छा ये बता नवाब साहब कहाँ हैं कलकत्ते गए हुए हैं आजकल में आ जाएंगे अब तुम अपनी सुनाओ क्या करोगे सुन के खुशी की महफिल है अच्छी अच्छी बातें करो अच्छा उसी गजल का एक और शेर सुनो also a very tragic story uh, so i won't get into the all that but the thing is that the, there is also a flashback of how they were all together she was together with her sister and then she got abducted and how she went she reached that kotha and the other girl the her other sister she became uh, malkin and she be, she got married to a nawab and she he, that unfortunately when she discovers that this is the same man with whom she was in love with so it's a, it's also a very very uh, emotional drama in umrao jan and that was a very emotional moment i wanted to show you that moment any anyways so these are also these memories and memories overlapping and coming back to each other so i will just come back to the last portion of my my uh, today's uh, today's presentation that since the narrative structure you know every film and how it converts it into history uh, it is uh, no this is also called popular culture popular history so it is not very difficult to see why the historical quote and quote is as old as indian cinema itself the difference between the historical 
and other cinema uh, lies only in the former's attempt to reconstruct period history with the help of legend and historiography. So early Indian cinema's employment of history does not appear surprising given the colonial conditions in which it labored. A society denied historical agency by its foreign rulers was bound to respond with its own version of the past. But as, as it claims that the response become very problematic primarily because the notions on which it was based were borrowed from the colonial discourse on Indian history. So the relationship of history and cultural identity precisely had become slowly very particularly significant to Indians since the establishment and consolidation of British colonial rule in India. So by the time the cinema came into the hands of the Indian elite, the social need to imagine, construct, and define group and individual identities had assumed a paramount political importance at various levels of Indian society. So therefore, it is not very surprising uh, to note that culture and history were central to the work of pioneer producer directors like R.G. Torney and D.G. Falke. So uh, the jaw of religious mythologicals and devotionals uh, during the early years, early years of nationhood. Uh, so it including the saint movies based on the lives of bhakti saints um, like Ganeshar and Tukaram, they were made to answer the ontological questions of identity and morality which had become very important to Indians living in the first half of the 20th century. So popular silent films like Pundalik, Raja Harishchandra, Lanka Dahan, Mohini Bhashwara, and Savitri Satyabhan were imbued with cultural and moral messages directed at Indian and European audiences alike. So these films quickly became very popular among the peasants who quite like Raj Kapoor and his friends do in Peace Kasam flock to the outskirts of Bombay to watch them screened in temporary moving theaters. So the films often mimicked and very innovated folk art forms like the Tamasha in Maharashtra and the Nautanki in North India, not to speak of the Parsi theater, which had emerged as the dominant form of entertainment in much of urban India since the latter half of the 19th century. So uh, Falke's reformist interpretation of caste and instrumentalist use of cinema drew the working classes in large numbers to his shows. So alluring were the attractions of cinema and early cinema that Falke's insistence on common seating were not taken amiss by the normally caste divided audiences. Whether this advocate of a syncretic Hindu Muslim culture, which was successful in achieving caste delusion and national integration through the cinema, it is very difficult to say, but certainly the novelty of the cinema and the opportunity to have a darshan of Lord Ram quelled a popular enthusiasm for the roving theaters cutting across class, caste, religion, and region. So in more recent times, such scenes have been witnessed upon the screening of surprise hits like Jai Santoshima. It was almost released uh, the same decade like Shole. But like, with like Shole, Jai Santoshima is uh, also a very, very, uh, it's a cult film and deliberately made uh, teleserials like Ramayana and Mahabharata. The way people had, uh, I, I, I remember we were um, children at that time when Ramayana was being sc uh, screened on every Sunday, Sunday morning. So people, <laughs> after taking early bath and sometimes with folded hands, they would uh, sit in front of your television, television set and watch Ramayana very, very religiously. So Ramayana was immensely, it was terribly extremely popular. It's a very, very popular serial. But I don't think these days also people are doing a bit of experiments like Ram Yuga. There is a new serial. I was I just I was just watching it with 
all uh, muscled, <laughs> very good figure and very uh, beautiful model type uh, Sita and others. But anyways, uh, they tried to made it look more human. Uh, but I don't think that uh, it is. Um, it, it does have that kind of an acceptance or people are people do really get moved by uh, you know all these deliberations people have their own nations people have their own likings and dislikings uh, whatever many how whatever many and, and uh, what it might sound illogical as well but that doesn't matter after a point yeah so uh, the, you know there are so this uh, I, I will just come back to my um, point that the, what exactly was the power of the cinema. Uh, the, you know, the power of the cinema is actually to influence popular sensibilities by the use of historical imagination. And it was demonstrated during the formative years of Hindi cinema. Uh, the saint movies of the early 20th century, it is very important to remember it responded to the rising religious and caste strife in modern India. So these films hammered home the point that India had an indigenous tradition of social protest anti-caste ideology and human rights struggle embodied in Bhakti. So the realization that the memory of these heterodox counter elite traditions had purposefully been suppressed by the elite discourses of reform, revival and politics which had developed in the 19th century underscored such revolutionary films. So, um, Hence, Dada Shahid Falke's pioneering ventures and um, based on the colonized intellectual's historical self-perception and need for the national integration as it was, ironically ended up bolstering notions of culture-specific Indian identities established in Western academia and societies by the long-drawn colonial and orientalist project. So this may not been, this may not have been Falke's intention, but he was probably helpless against a Western appropriation of his portrayal of Indian traditions. So the idea was that India was religious, primarily Brahminical, Hindu, and ancient, had gained widespread social acceptance among the British and the influential sections of the Hindu elites during the 19th century. So with the passage of time, this idea was contested and transformed into political power by the vested interests of Indian society. This belief also very carefully nurtured by colonial officials and educators at various levels was made explicit in the di divisive policies of the Raj and Indian social reformers and revivalists alike. So the academic generalizations of Orientalists following the Brahman informed researches of the philologist, Indologist, Sir William Jones first and 19th century scholars like Max Muller later were crucial to the emergence of a specific religio-cultural Hindu Indian identity in the 19th century. So the glorification of Sanskrit, the Aryan civilization, the Vedic age, and the appropriation of Indianness to sovereign interpretations of Indian history were only a logical outcome of the intellectual process set in motion set in motion by the exigencies of colonialism and its education uh, system. I will come to the end of my uh, lecture today. And uh, I will say uh, that, so uh, in many years ago, the Warner Brothers, they were planning to an oriental extravaganza, Taj Mahal to portray grandeur on screen. And the Hollywood version would, in the words of its screenplay writer, a Shakespearean tale of romance and intrigue in the imperial court. So the Shakespearean twist 
which I suspect was inspired by Shekhar Kapoor's much acclaimed Elizabeth, which was released in 1998, was devised to make the film popular in the West at a time when popular interest in a globalizing India was seen to be increasing. So in contrast to the historicals produced in colonial India, several historicals like the confounding Shahid, Kranti, even Mangal Pandey, they all celebrated the anti-colonial struggle of a putative Indian nation. So almost all of them are devoted to constructing a nation on the lines laid down by establishment historiography in the ultimate analysis, the hegemony of commercial cinema in Indian society ensures that its historical narratives do not transcend the limits imposed upon it by its own historical beliefs. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ma'am. Thank you for that brilliant lecture. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, I think I found your argument uh, of the dichotomy between pseudo history and history also resonating in uh, filmmaking. Uh, thank you also for speaking uh, about uh, the uh, significance of visuality uh, in uh, in film and films and film history. Uh, uh, one of the most fascinating uh, arguments uh, that you put forth uh, is of uh, a televised uh, series and its impact uh, on uh, the audience and how a whole generation has grown up watching. Uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata and how it continues to hug the uh, limelight on a lot of our, uh, uh, our TV channels and even uh, on, on uh, web platforms uh, now. Uh, but more importantly, as a historian, I uh, simply loved uh, the bit on Historia 40 or historiography of the formative years of Indian uh, movie making. Uh, thank you so much for uh, locating Indian uh, films uh, in the larger trajectory of uh, world cinema. Uh, and uh, uh, I am very, very thankful to both of our speakers, Dr. Sebastian Joseph, who uh, introduced the theme or a theme and methodology uh, of history of uh, 40 so comprehensively and in such a splendid way. I, I think it impressed upon all of us the significance uh, of uh, using films uh, as source of history and how it throws open this this amazing uh, portal for uh, future historians and budding historians among students that uh, we have with us. Uh, and also to uh, Nandida ma'am for an equally brilliant uh, lecture. Uh, I, I hope uh, both the speakers can spare another 10, 15 minutes of their time for a, a brief session of Q&A because we do have some questions in the chat box and I think there are also others who might want to ask questions. I know it is lunchtime, but can we can we please have another 10, 15 minutes of your time, please? I think I've exceeded no? the time limits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as nobody told me anything, so I just kind of continued. <laughs> no, that's absolutely OK. Yeah, I, I really wanted to show more visuals. Yeah. So. Uh, Dr. Malavika, can I respond to Dr. K.S. Madhavan's question? Yes. Shall I read out the question, sir? No, no, no I have already read it. Eh? I know, just for so, the audience. Yeah, uh, please, 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 you can read huh. it. So uh, we have a lot of accolades in the chat box and we have uh, Dr. K.S. Madhavan's question. Uh, question. It was an interesting lecture delivered by Dr. Sebastian. My concern is on the similarities in the process of making of narrative floats in the films as invented artifactual images and the way in which historians invented the eventful past as narrative floats in postmodern sense of the term. So that's a very serious question. Thank you, Dr. K. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. K. S. Madhavan, for this uh, wonderful question. So let me uh, respond to this question uh, by taking cue from what Dr. Nandita Banerjee you know, exhibited Patar uh, Panjali that uh, Durga and Apu witnessing the uh, train, the coming of the train, which can be considered as you know, an invitation to modernity, the modern age in the case of Apu, it made, was made possible and Durga accidentally fell. And she was not able, able to get a glimpse of that implicating you know, the structural problems connected with the women empowerment and all such things. Whereas in Ritu Kadak's uh, films, you know, you know that uh, 
the train becomes a metaphor of uh, a symbol for a, a tragedy, something like a historical tragedy, the partition. The train becomes problematized like that. But coming to Madhavan's uh, question, I wish to say uh, that the first uh, uh, mo uh, silent motion picture, the arrival of a train, there is a connection between arrival of a train and train in Satyajit Ray and also train in Ruthu Kadak. Uh, the arrival of a train, uh, Lumiere's production's arrival of a train simply, you know, uh, showcases or it, it, it filmed only the arrival of the train and some people are walking through the platform and uh, some people are getting into the train and some are alighting down. And um, it's about, you know, that is the event. But uh, from there, you can see the development of historical film because the historical film, uh, I'm not saying that locationally uh, arrival of a train is uh, relevant for the topic which we are discussing, but the train becomes a social symbol you know, it becomes active in history only when people uh, try to catch the train. Uh, they have stories connected with that. They're going for a different, uh, you know, uh, job stations. Uh, the lovers are uh, moving in the train. You know, uh, you can see poor people, uh, handicapped people inside the train, you know, uh, then the train becomes, you know, something like a social phenomena. So when the train, that uh, particular uh, technology, the train is connected to the lives of people, you know, it becomes, you know, it's it become social. It, when it is connected to a historical event, uh, it becomes social. So that, that's the most important thing that you have to bear in mind. So the presentation, the narrative plot that is created by the historian, the narrative plot that is created also by the filmmaker, belong to two different systems. That is the historiography, the kind of textual representation, as I told you, is entirely different from filmography. Filmography has to present a history which is, you know, which has taken uh, into, into its ampit, you know, certain other things which are not of consideration for the historian. So um, when you look at this narrative from the point of view of a historian, a uh, two looks different, but in reality, these two are the same. Because you can also see how uh, histories are emotionally charged, how histories are falsified. At greater the menace that is happening now, you know, histories are falsified, histories are distorted. So much of distortion is happening. It's an easy medium, wonderful medium, also to distort. So you have to vary of that. You have to wait to watch it. So this particular process of making variety plots in the film, so you, so you have to take the system problem also there, the system of writing history for the historian and system of filming. So that is why the train, the arrival of a train, that is a Lumiere, uh, Lumiere production's arrival of a train, it's a film. But when you see the film, today you get nothing out of that. But when you, when you when, might you just go back to transpose it to yourself to the 19th century, 1895, the film was produced, you know, it becomes, you know, a great event in that sense. So the spectator is to be connected in that. The spectator of the 21st century, 2021, is different from the spectator of the 19th century. So the spectator's account is also be taken into account. You, know, you cannot simply see cinema as a historical film. Even, it, even if it is a historical film, the main agenda, as I argued here, is the spectator. I'm not saying that things have to be made, you know, something like a dream-like thing eh, for the spectator, eh, giving, uh, you know, so much of fantasies, things like that. So this has to be taken. Up. When it is connected to stories, the train becomes meaningful. When it is connected to history, it has to be connected to the life world of the people. Only then it becomes meaningful. So this is my uh, response to Dr. K. S. Mother. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, a comment by uh, Mr. Shine Ovi. Uh, I think that's also a question in the form of a comment. Uh, actually, I have a feeling that the cinemas in the beginning or in the early period, uh, the accessibility as a viewer uh, was restricted uh, or strictly reserved to the richest in the society. So I think the question is about the audience or, or the spectatorship. Yes, yes, of, yes, uh, yes. The, huh. yes, yes. This is the balcony effect of history. You know, you have, you, when you, when you try to, um, can I answer this? Yes, yes sir, please. please. Then, uh, please. Then, uh, when, when you dissect, make a dissection of the film theaters, you know, in Malayalam, it was a Kotaka. You can see there were people sitting on the floor, on the benches, on the chairs, and then on Ashoka chairs, and there was a category called the reserved. 
So the film theater itself depicted this kind of a social structure in those days. The hierarchically ordained feudal society can be best, uh, uh, you know, explicated by understanding the architecture of theater. He's right, but now it is too democratic. So the history history has you know come down to the balconies, the balcony. You know, when I when I say it is balcony, it, it belongs to a different uh, segment in that sense. History uh, is everywhere. History in the theater, you know, the technology, the democratization of. Uh, Technology, or the you mean the use of technologies, the wider application of technologies, the online streaming, then the social media, and theaters opening to all people. You know, it's a great social space for viewing. So viewing is also connected to histories. So now there is a there is a there is a problem with that. There is a prospect with that in the sense that the films which are depicted can be questioned by a multitude of people. It is open. Technology opened it as well as technology can compress it, you know, in the in some ways. So that that's a that's a good comment from Shane. I'm, I'm sir. I just I just thought of, but I don't know. In Bengal, uh, maybe when cinema was started, I don't know whether. But then we had a places where we used to have open tents, you know, even in open air. There was a um, even in our childhood, and I think I. Had heard this from my father because he was from a village. That even in villages they used to gather for Pramothesh Bodua and you know Durga Dash Banerjee cinema films. So it was not that much of an elite affair anymore. In Bengal, I think in Bengal it was a little different because I think it was they were very very much inclusive in kind of all and everybody. Even even the women, even the women earlier there was used to be a parda. But I think uh, we are in uh, late fifties or mid fifties. So the, even the women they would visit the theaters and they would have loved it. The especially the matinee shows. The matinee shows became so popular. Uttam Kumar, I, I think you know him. He's a um, the Bengali superstar, the one and only superstar Bengal ever had. So he was. He used to be called like matinee idol. Because every yeah, everybody, especially the women, because he was a he used to be, uh, he was fit for every role, even whatever script is given to him. He was a perfect brother, perfect husband, perfect lover, a boy next door. So people would you know kind of uh, relate to him. He was he was inside. He was a family member. So the stars, they were not only a star, they was actually a family member. So in Bengal, I think it was a little different, uh, you know, with things and all. Huh. So I think ma'am had a question. Uh, ma'am has a question. We have Professor R. Mahalakshmi with us. We are very, very glad that you joined, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, I think you have a question. Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you so much, Malvika, for organizing this wonderful webinar. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sebastian Joseph and Dr. Nandita Banerjee for a wonderful uh, hour of discussion on such a such a wonderful theme. Um, I speak from a, a place of complete ignorance. This is not my area of work. And uh, it is only as someone who's interested in visual histories in the pre-modern period that uh, I, I even feel that I can come in on this. So please excuse me if my uh, comments or my questions seem uh, naive or, uh, or abrasive even. Um, I, I was particularly struck by uh, what Dr. Sebastian Joseph spoke of uh, right at the beginning uh, of the importance of technology um, uh, as being very, very central. Uh, so to look at the technological aspect and the way in which film histories have tended to do that and also to look content-wise and uh, uh, and it is uh, only with the kind of theorization that uh, draws from Hayden White and then, uh, you know, is explicated very brilliantly in Rosenstone's work that we have the issue of imagination also coming in. Uh, so this postmodern turn that is there in uh, historical writing is something that's quite striking. And I think for many of us historians also, it's very, very important to take cognizance of this. But uh, one of the things that uh, that Rosenstone also does briefly talk about, and uh, Nandita, Dr. Nandita Banerjee briefly, uh, she, she dropped the term, but did not go into it in detail, uh, is the issue of authenticity. Uh, and that is something that I uh, want to 
draw your attention to and if you could uh, also say something about it the issue of authenticity because i'd like to go back to roland barthes uh, or to walter benjamin but roland barthes in particular uh, and the way in which he talks about uh, the image the visual image photography actually specifically uh, as providing that sense of authenticity and cinema more so Uh, seems to project that kind of a notion of authenticity. How it is important for us to critically engage with that. Uh, that is something that I was wondering if you could uh, also come in on. And uh, the second thing is, uh, of course, the possibilities of uh, of liberation, of emancipation uh, through visuality that we do pro- uh, we do have, which histories may not allow us to do. especially the histories of those who are absent in the historical record uh, so what happens i mean we tend to treat those silences uh, as silences and therefore not have anything really to say about uh, the people who have been silenced uh, so you know the issue of intersectionality is something else that i would like uh, you know if both of you could just briefly talk about it uh, that there are representational biases in the sources we use as historians uh, but uh, possibly that these are also evident in um, uh, in uh, films uh, in historical films in film histories uh, that we need to engage with uh, these intersectionalities so i was wondering if you could uh, talk about that also very very briefly and um, yeah, this is uh, particularly um, you know because Uh, both dr joseph as well as dr banerji have spoken about the affective realm they have spoken about uh, uh, about uh, specters of violence that might be um, uh, visualized that might be very vividly portrayed in cinema in the cinematic medium but also in the photographic medium and i was wondering if you have come across the work the brilliant work of zahid choudhry uh called the after image of empire where he looks at photography and he talks about how post 1857 in particular uh in the 19th century how photography comes to india and how it gets habilitated uh with a view to providing authenticity uh to the colonial experience and imagination uh and then he talks about this brilliant experiment by uh, this photographer called Felix uh, Bieto uh, where Bieto actually uh, digs out the graves um, of people who have been massacred and he displays those bodies and takes photos so these people have been shoved into uh, into makeshift graves hundreds of bodies together he pulls them all out and he actually stages that specter of violence so cinema certainly has more of that possibility and and i'd like that you know we think about it because uh, then it takes me to the final point which is uh, something that bart uh, also has raised derida has raised uh, most brilliantly on intentionality and on the uh, reader here the spectator uh, what does it mean then for the spectator to be faced with these kinds of specters uh, whether they are uh, uh, erotic whether they are violent uh, it's a, it's a very important and uh, crucial question i think that we need to address thank you so much i uh, apologize if these seem too naive and uh, coming from um, you know a, a very uh, ignorant position thank you so much for that question ma'am Uh, sir uh, no actually i i think i would in, uh, try to incorporate what ma'am had uh, made an <clears throat> very thorough observation i did not know of this uh, book also by zahid choudhry and yes what does it mean as a uh, spectator so um, i think in my lecture i just tried to uh, touch upon those things while i was speaking of this documentaries made on um, german soldiers or uh, while this um, there was this iraq war and uh, 
but yes, uh, I think they are very, very important. There are very important things to explore and to incorporate. I will try, I will definitely try when I will try to um, write this paper and I will incorporate all these points. And <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am, for a brilliant observation that you made. Uh, I will definitely remember this. And uh, thank Sebastian, you. sir, has any remarks? Thank you very uh, much, uh, yes. Professor Mahalishmi. Actually, it is. You are invited for uh, that international seminar in connection with the uh, Bern University. You know, I wonder if this university that made me to work more on these images. We can have a lot of uh, histories of, for example, a hill station which I presented there of Munar can be better narrated through photographs than through uh, the text. But your question, uh, you know, deserves very important, is significant, very important, very relevant question. The authenticity is an issue that is that is raised by Robert Rosenstern. And the authenticity issue comes to a different level when, when historical films are produced in the Hollywood. Uh, usually there is a board of historians to scrutinize and to guide the script writer, which is not a practice in India. Because while I was interacting with the script writer, Gopan Chidambaram, a splendid script writer, now he's coming with another historical film in Kerala, Turamukam. And the one was Eobita Pusangam, which talks about the landscape changes in Munar. It's a complex issue. When I discussed, he used to, you know, consult all available historical documents, land documents in both in archives and also testimonies, photographs and everything. But he admitted that he lacked the, the idea of consulting historians before making that because the club life of the European is absent in the film. So films can be enriched by the incorporation of the scholastic uh, inputs uh, given by the uh, historians, the researchers in the field. Um, so that's a very good point because if you want to make it more authentic, it has to be, the script has to be scrutinized and verified by a board of historians. You know? But in the industry cases, for example, if you look at the question of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Aska, Aga, you know, if you take the questions, uh, the, the question, uh, the, the Patmavad, the Patmavad, and films like that, there is a corporatocracy, the, which, which signal the point of the politics of the culture industry in producing certain cinema, certain films in order to falsify, in order to fabricate the existing social order with a great political and economic uh, motives in that sense. But coming back to Professor Maharishmi, I also wish to, um, uh, wish to uh, elaborate that in film, see, uh, 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 this authenticity is very important. At the same time, the spectator issue is very important because it's actually a film, a historical film is a witnessing again phenomenon. People are witnessing again. You are witnessing 1850s and revolt. If you are witnessing Gandhi's assault to Satyagraha, the Dandi March, you know, you are walking with them. So the credibility, the, the authenticity is added through a transposition of the audience into the screen. For you take, for example, Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potan King. You can say, you can see that, you know, the audience, the entire audience, the spectators are on the Odisha steps where the rebel army was, you know, they were simply shot by the, uh, the uh, king's forces. So you are there as one among the people who were shot dead by the, uh, by the, by the, by the military, the, the king's army. So such a type of witnessing again, such a bringing back of the Odisha steps, uh, sometimes become problematic that the authenticity issue emerges there. The only, the only panacea, the only panacea uh, is for a greater scrutiny of the uh, historical film script, which is sometimes, you know, not appreciated by the film industry because, you know, basically uh, the film industry looks at the, you know, their, their motive is profit also, you know, they have to take into account the large crew that is working there for the film. It is not just the case of a, a historian, receiving, historian receiving royalty or not. So, um, but uh, you are a, uh, uh, your uh, uh, observations are very, very serious observations. Uh, I consider you not just as an ancient or an early uh, medieval Indian historian, but you are a historian of photographs and cinema. Uh, at the same time, you also mentioned about uh, Roland Barthes, you know, Roland Barthes, especially the essay, Camera Lucida, you know, which talks about the politics of the uh, photographs. Every photograph, uh, behind every photograph, there is an eye, there is a gaze. So the historians have to be cautious about that.
Thank you, Professor Mahalashmi, for the wonderful, serious, and thought-provoking question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the question as well as the uh, wonderful answers and the discussion which ensued. Uh, we'll maybe take two more questions. Uh, I'll just read out Dr. Uh, Aksa Aga's uh, question. She is a faculty member from the Department of uh, History at SRM. Uh, she uh, is a specialist in medieval history. Uh, because I also feel that it is very important uh, for students to uh, listen to this question. Uh, the question is to Dr. Sebastian. Uh, do the films like Patmavar that create visual representation of a Persianized Turkish ruler as a sexually virile barbaric Muslim ruler uh, and feeds into an already prevalent negative stereotype, uh, quite contrary to what it was with respect to Persian mannerisms, uh, and sophistication, merit and uh, merit and academic critique by the historians. And when films that are made to represent past require compulsory historians review, given that the impact that these movies have on the social fabric uh, before production. Uh, this is actually, this is an excellent question, very serious question. Um, even though my lecture, my lecture was you know, restricted towards the theory and methodology part, um, uh, I wished, uh, you know, to explain more on this, but time uh, restriction is there. But you see, uh, while responding to Professor Mahalashmi, I also hinted to the particular uh, culture industry. The cinema uh, becomes a corporatized uh, academic, sorry, entertainment, you know, which looks at, you know, uh, projecting uh, certain ideologies which are not uh, conducive for uh, national integration, which are not conducive for incorporating pluralism, pluralities, and diversities. Uh, it also uh, creates, you know, as she said, a kind of a memory. Because every cinema, like especially Patma, you know, the impact factor on the audience uh, to a greater extent, you know, um, cinema sometimes monumentalize certain memories. And these memories can be transmitted from people to people, from uh, area, region to region, and from generation to generation. And these kind of films can become uh, you know, uh, uh, become tools and uh, methods to continue the falsification of history. So uh, you have to be very cautious about such films because you know the production company of this film, you know, uh, who produced this film, it's very open to all. So uh, definitely this kind of filmic representations are made with the ulterior motive of, uh, uh, of uh, exploiting uh, economy also, and not only politi political purpose, but also economy also, in order to uh, manipulate, uh, you know, a section of the audience, the mind of the audience, so that the mind of the audience are corrupted, contaminated with these kind of ideas. And they, on their part, you know, uh, get, you know, affiliate sensibly, uh, on their part, sensibly affiliate with the kind of a dogma, with the kind of a cinematic uh, visualization or politics of cinematic visualization uh, that these corporations make. So uh, one thing which I have to uh, respond to Aksa Akha is that, you know, uh, these kind of films uh, need to be studied and scrutinized by historians. And uh, uh, there is also a possible way of bringing film history uh, as uh, uh, part of your curriculum or syllabi and to educate people about these kind of feelings because the only option that is available for the uh, historians the faculty members on our side uh, is to academically uh, oppose this kind of uh, 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 fancified, falsified and corporatized production of history which is very inimical to the uh, to the political fabric of India. So this is my kind, uh, my kind response to Aksa. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, I think if our students have any questions, uh, not just SRM students, any students from any institution, I think they're a bit overwhelmed by the kind of discussion that is happening here. Usually they are like, uh, brimming over with questions. So do we have any, any, uh, any students who would like to ask a question? Or, or anyone else, maybe we can take one last question before winding up.
Okay, we have a question from uh, Parul Shukla, who is a first year BA history student. Uh, the question is, how would one... I think Jyoti Singh also is there. Okay, she there also is... raised hand, yeah. Okay, Jyoti, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, sure, ma'am. So, uh, so you had men so you had mentioned that film history is also the history of the film crew of the spot boy and the maybe even of the makeup man. What influence does the social background of the production team influence filmmaking? Thank you, Jyoti. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it's part of the social history of the nation. Film industry is to be seen as uh, part of uh, the social history of the nation. You can definitely go ahead with, you know, writing. Th that comes, I think the question is to me, you know, I think she asked the question. Both of us. Is, is it both, both, of, both of you, sir? Maybe both of us. Yeah. Okay. So the type one type of film history, which deals basically with the industry history, you know, it 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 has to um, it ha it has to uh, widen its scope by bringing not just stars, you know, yeah. but also the production boys, the light boys, and all the people who are associated with that. You know, a kind of uh, history from the margins you can uh, have from the film industry also. I think it's not written yet. Maybe it's not explored properly, but maybe in future, like uh, with the barring historians, they can, you know, take it into consideration. There are so many things, so much to learn to, so much to, you know, so many areas where you can do actually extensive research. So, yeah, I don't think much research has been done on this, this areas. These are largely, uh, unexplored regions yeah but they, they are a very important integral part of any film any filmmaking because the crews and the productions and everyone yes so there are few papers i think in research gate or in just or sometimes if you search you can get maybe one or two important papers mm, yeah one was by uh, some uh, indian institute of advanced studies uh, fellow his name i also remember prem singh Yes, and she. It, I, I know, don't know whether he is uh, it's he or she, but uh, he was uh, teaching in uh, Delhi University Department of Hindi. So I think he had a paper. He had an article on this. So you can go through this. We also have movies about movies now, like movie in a movie situation. <laughs> exactly. So that's exactly. an area which can be explored. Exactly. There are some works on uh, based on the Bollywood also. You know, from Hindi films. Yes. Films, yes. There yes. Are some good works which it talks about the industry as a whole. Yeah, I, yeah, forgot, yeah. I forgot her name, the historian, her historian, you know, she used to sit in the, uh, uh, in a, 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 by the locations and uh, she interviewed these people, you know, because oral testimonies from the light boys and the people, you know, belonging to the, uh, the working class within the, uh, the lower working class within the uh, cinema industry, you know, you can follow a different kind of methodology because, you know, uh, type of articles or cinema, they are uh, significantly absent. They are not visible in cinema. Only the stars and the uh, major people are associated with the cinema, but you can, of course, uh, follow a different methodology. Why can't you interview a light boy? Why can't you interview a technician? Why can't you interview a food person who talks about the cinema world from his own or her own perception? It's a kind of, you know, how you invoke a methodology different from the stereotyped methodology. You can go back to <laughs> oral history. You can go back to oral history and write a history of a of a of a light boy instead of a film star, a superstar. I know a person. Uh, his name is. Uh, he's also. A film, he's a film historian, uh, but he yeah, he's a writer. He was uh, from Dehradun. While he was, he's from Jainu actually. While he was writing his PhD thesis, he was also working as a spot boy in Yash Chopra banner. So just to, you know, huh. so while he was writing his PhD thesis and nobody would um, uh, just uh, think that he is someone, he's a scholar, he was a renowned scholar, but then he was always uh, being with the cast and crew and the production people while he was writing his thesis and he was taking very um, uh, important notes and all. So I think there had been people, there are still men, we have to do a bit of searching, but there are people. But still, more and more to be explored. More and more informations we need regarding this. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think Paru. Thank you, so thank you, ma'am. That was Jyoti. 
I think Parul had a question. Uh, her data is running out. That is why she had to post it in the chat box. She just messaged me. It is about uh, the location of animation films in history. And uh, Professor Mahalakshmi has added a rider to it. Uh, he specifically related to prehistory. Mm -hmm. Pradyuman also has a question is, would it be right to say that films can be used as primary source of information? Yeah, sure. Definitely. Films, um, you know, when you go by the genre type in the second type of film history, that is, which talks about, you know, I talked about in a, every film as a kind of historical source. So in that sense, it depends on your cognitive capacity to excavate the meanings hidden in these shorts. So first you have to study the cinema, the film, uh, the way of pr uh, presentation in cinema, different technologies connected with that. Then you will be able to understand that, you know, it can be used as a primary source. Why not? For understanding landscape changes, cinema can be used as a primary source. For understanding changes in actor, modes, gestures. For understanding campus life, the best alternative for you to study campus life is through taking films. You know, because films definitely carry the campus age. Sometimes, you know, the campus is more fictional than the films. <laughs> so, so definitely you can do that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, let us uh, wrap up the Q&A session. It is it's only because I, I am very sure that there are more questions. And I am uh, afraid that I might have skipped over some questions in the chat box because the chat box is overflowing with uh, comments. Uh, so uh, let me, uh, it's only because of the lack of time that we have to wrap up now. Uh, let me uh, invite Dr. Manvinder Singh from the Department uh, of History uh, to give the word of thanks now. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was wonderful session by both uh, Dr. Uh, by uh, uh, Nandita Ma'am and Sebastian Sir. This is the second time uh, uh, you know, so we had Sebastian Sir uh, uh, presenting in the Saram University. And uh, some wonderful questions that were uh, raised and particularly Mahalakshmi Ma'am. Uh, let me thank again both the speaker for uh, you know wonderfully elaborating, particularly on the question as a historian, which interests all of us. This uh, sort of a in ontological similarity in the ways in which you know uh, uh, the, we construct narrative in history as well as filmmaking, which both in particular Sebastian sir has explored uh, right in his lecture, and then. Uh, Nandita Ma'am also. And the question of uh, privileging, uh, uh, you know, visual, uh, or, sorry, the textual uh, you know, uh, uh, sources over the visual. And then uh, Nandita Ma'am also went into the uh, elaborating the formative years of, uh, of uh, Indian filmmaking and the kind of proofs that were used. Let me also thank my colleagues, uh, uh, you know, uh, Malvika, uh, Mega, and Aksa, who in particular were more involved because in, uh, uh, on the WhatsApp, huh? and then uh, I also apologize for my, you know, in, in case I was not involved in, the, in this webinar. Uh, let me also thank uh, Vice Chancellor Sir, who uh, in fact has been encouraging uh, the history department to organize this webinar for a long period of time. And uh, because of, uh, you know, some other reasons we were not able to, but we are all glad that we started with the you know the historiography of film, and we had two wonderful speaker on, uh, on 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 this subject. Uh, let me thank all the also the students who uh, you know also contributed uh, to the to the discussion, and and our colleagues uh, in NSF University and others who had uh, joined this webinar. So thank you so much, uh, and and we hope that uh, uh, Nandita Ma'am and Sebastian would also in future also would you know uh, uh, contribute to the history department at the SRM University, because this is a department which has just uh, started, I mean, two, three years. Mahalakshmi ma'am has already, I mean, she is part of studies. You know, so thank you so much to everyone who was part of this webinar. Thank you so much.
thank you dr manvinder thanks thank you one and all let me also take a moment before uh, we conclude uh, to point out the erudition in the audience that we have today we have uh, of course we have professor mahalakshmi but we also uh, had dr jayasri from the department of math uh, we have uh, members from our management which is i think a first and and, and uh, they been messaging me saying that they enjoyed the uh so webinar as well and we also have dr biju we have dr virendra uh we have dr aparna dr parvati several esteemed uh, historians and scholars in the uh, audience uh, i am so sorry if i have missed out some names thank you so much uh, for joining us and thanks to all the students uh, uh who uh, made very very important uh, contributions to the discussion and all the scholars who uh, asked questions uh, and also for uh, listening in patiently it's been almost uh, two and a half hours and we still have about uh, 80 members listening in thank you so much uh, this is a great flagging of uh, or 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 the a great kick starting of our webinar series uh the the we will have the next uh, session probably in the first week of june and uh, we will uh, let you know uh, to uh, mail uh, very very soon of the next theme that we will be exploring thank you one and all thank you so much thank you thank you it's been a pleasure